Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Lisanul Quran, easier than English, lesson 15. Alhamdulillah, all the praises and thanks are due to Allah. We have completed 14 lessons, by which Alhamdulillah we have acquired significant amount of Arabic. We are now at a very pivotal stage in our course. We're going to begin to take a closer look at verbs. We're not going to jump into the subject. We're going to begin first by looking at an overview of the verbal sentence and its key components. And then we're going to take a very close look at the past tense verb, how it is formed and all the different forms of it. And not only that, inshallah, you're going to learn a very simple way of conjugating the verbs yourself. So any past tense verbs that fall into this pattern, you'll be able to instantly recognize them and inshallah, with a little bit of help, also translate them correctly. So we have a lot to cover. Let's begin with Allah's blessed name. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, we are already familiar with Jumla Ismiya. Most important thing to note, it begins with an ism and has two parts. So here we have a sentence in Arabic, Muhammadun Rasulun. Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a messenger. It has all the components of the sentence, your muqtada, which is your subject, khabar, which is your predicate. We went through this in detail. So in Arabic, when a sentence begins with an ism, it is called Jumla Ismiya. Here is an example of a Jumla Ismiya. In Arabic, we can also begin a sentence with a verb, which we do not normally do in English. So here is one example. Allah created mankind. insana. Allah created mankind. It has three components here. The fa'lun, which is your verb. The fa'ilun, which is your doer. And the object uh, here, which is al-insana. So three components of the sentence. Fa'ilun, fa'ilun, and maf'ulun bihi, which are in Arabic. This is a jumla fi'liya. Please note, it is beginning with a verb, and therefore it is called jumla fi'liya. It has one essential part, uh, two essential parts, one being the verb itself, and the second being the doer. It may or may not have an object. In this case, it has. So that is called maf'ulun bihi in Arabic, the object. So these three components are coming together to form a sentence. So when we compare this type of sentence with English, in English we have a standard sentence structure. That is a subject followed by a verb and then we have an object if required in the sentence. So for example, when we say Hamid ate the mango. Who ate the mango? Hamid. So Hamid is the subject and the mango was that which received the act of the verb and that is the object. We have another sentence here. I parked the car. Okay, so the car is the object of being parked and I am the doer of that sentence. Then we have another sentence here. They slept. There is no object required it to complete the meaning of this sentence. And lastly, we have another example. John helped us. So the pronoun us is now the object. And that's normally how we form sentences in English. Subject, verb and object. In English, we cannot form a sentence without a verb. Even the word is, am um, or are are actually verbs in the English language. So we have the standard structure. In Arabic, we have a lot of flexibility. We've seen that we can begin a sentence with an ism. Here is the example again of us beginning a sentence with a verb, which we do not normally do in the English language. So again, please note these three terms. We have the fa'lun, we have the fa'ilun, and we have the maf'ulun bihi if required. So we have our verb, we have our doer, and we have our object. So this is how the order of a normal nominal a verbal sentence is in the Arabic language. So that's the distinction between Arabic and English. We are beginning a sentence with a verb. And this is the subject of today's uh, inshallah study or lesson. We are going to be looking at verbs. We're going to begin with the past tense and then inshallah ta'ala we'll look at all the components in the forthcoming lesson in some detail. Right at the beginning of our course, I'm reminded you that in Arabic, the word order isn't as critical as it is in the English language. So look at the flexibility that gives us in Arabic. I have here a nominal sentence, Jumla Ismiya, Hamidun Nasara Zaidan. Let me explain what's going on here. Hamidun is my subject. Nasara, he helped. This is a verb we haven't studied yet. And then we have Zaidan, which is the object of the verb Nasara. So we have the fa'il, the verb, and we have the object. This is now together going to form our khabar. So we have our two parts of our sentence beginning with an ism, hamidun. What did he do? Nasara zaidan. 
he helped Zaid. So this is a jumla ismiya. Why? Because it is beginning with an ism. Now take a look at another example of a sentence. I have exactly the same thing. The word order is slightly different. Here I have Nasara first, Hamidun, Zaydan. I'm sure you can work out by now that the first part, of course, is the verb. The second part is the doer. Why? Because the doer is always in the Rafa status. Please remember this golden rule. The doer is always Rafa status or Marfur, which you can see here, Hamidun. And the object is always in the Nasab status. So here you have here Zaydan. So Nasara, Hamidun, Zaydan. So we have now two sentences. One is a Jumla Ismiya and the other is a Jumla Fi'liya. So please take a note at both of these sentences. However, the translation in English will be exactly the same. Hamid helped Zaid. Hamid helped Zaid. Of course, there is a different subtlety in emphasis and others, which we will look at later. But the basic meaning is exactly the same. As far as you and I are concerned at the beginning, we're going to say one is Jumla Ismiya. Why? Because it begins with an Ism. The other one is the Jumla Fi'liya because it begins with a Fi'l. So I'm giving the same sort of message in the two sentences. One, I'm beginning with an Ism. The, in the other, I'm beginning with a verb. We will go, inshallah, don't worry, into the differences between them, what kind of subtle uh, message it gives. Just as a hint, bringing the subject first creates some sort of emphasis uh, in the sentence. So you can see that flexibility that we have in the Arabic language. So if you remember, the only thing about Jumla Fi'liya, it begins with a verb, has an essential element called the doer of the verb or component, and it has also object if required to complete the meaning. Of course, there are lots of other parts we can add to sentence to make our sentences a bit more elaborate, but we will look at that later. So please note these three points. So the three main components of Jumla Fi'liya are number one, the verb, number two, the doer. Both of these are essential. Then you may or may not have a object or the object, al maf'ul al bihi, which you can see here. So the verb in Arabic has three tenses. Either it can be a task that's been complete, madi, mudare, or amr. Don't worry, we're going to go through that in detail. And then we have the doer of the uh, verb, and that can actually be a pronoun or it can be a noun, just like in English, and we're going to look at that also in some detail. Maf'ulun bihi, the object, can also be a noun or it can also be a pronoun. Again, we will look at the both in detail, how to recognize them and also translate them. But for now, this sheet will give you the three main components of the verbal sentence. The root of Arabic. One of the most amazing aspect of the Arabic language is actually the verb study. When I first started Arabic, I couldn't see the wood for the trees and I was very confused. And I was jumping from one course to another and trying to learn things online and from books and whatsoever how I could find. It took me a long, long time to get around, alhamdulillah, uh, through the guidance of my teacher following certain lessons in a certain order, I found the subject of verbs very fascinating rather than being scary. The first time I saw them, I was confused, I must confess. But after go looking at the overview on the structure of the language, I found this aspect of Arabic absolutely amazing. Uh, I would say almost mind-boggling how the language has been structured. Very, very beautiful. The secret of the Arabic language is that most words are derived. Most words you're likely to come across are derived. Almost all the verbs are significant number of the nouns. Of course, huruf, the harf, they're not derived. So you have majority of the words are derived. And again, the majority of them are from three root letters. There are some which are four. There are only a handful which are five. But as far as you and I are concerned, 99.99% of our words that we're going to come across are going to be derived from three root letters. So therefore, I'll be only speaking about that. We'll briefly mention four root letters if we come across them uh, in the advanced study. Now, each and every derived word from the root will have some connection with the root meaning. So every time a word is derived from the root, the connection will come back to the root meaning. So we have here example, kaf, ta, and ba. I'm sure you can recognize these letters. So if you look at the dictionary, you'll find these three consonants coming together in that order has something to do with writing. And now we can derive verbs from it as well as we can derive nouns. So let's look at some verbs. Only These are only examples. There are thousands of words that could be derived from this root. So kataba simply means he wrote. Kataba simply means he wrote. And if I say kutiba, it means it was written. And then we have inkataba, which means 
it became written or he or it became written and kataba means he made somebody to write and then we have another form here kataba exchanging writing between something or exchanging a contract of some sort and then we have takataba we have exchange writing he made a contract okay iktataba he wrote himself and then we have istaktaba which means he sought writing so you can see here every single time i'm adding something to the root i'm getting a new verb new form of a verb and a new meaning so it is the root plus the addition of the vowels plus some uh, additional letters gives us additional meaning not only are verbs derived from the root letter we also have nouns for example katbun writing kitabun book which is a word we've already come across kitabatun writing okay kutayibun booklet small book we have katibun writer somebody who writes as a profession and maktubun something written down something that which was written and then you have maktabun a place of writing so it could be an office or a desk and then we have also maktabatun which is a library or a book store so you can see here now alhamdulillah it is from the three root letters and now we are deriving lots and lots of words the point i'm trying to get at is the base of the word comes from these three root letters and there are many roots and it is from there that the nouns and verbs are derived and i hope you can see that as an initial introduction inshallah you'll find this aspect of arabic very very fascinating and if you can get into this inshallah you've got the secret of the language you can now start using dictionary and of course over any word in the quran you can find its meaning and its root base meaning so this is the journey we're going to start with i'm just giving you this for the purpose of illustration so again as a summary almost all the words you're going to come across are based upon three root letters are derived from three root letters verbs all of them and nouns significant number of them and of course huruf do not are not derived this is the most important aspect of the language and again every meaning will somehow connect back to the root al fa'lu the verb every verb you see in arabic has so much detail within the word itself simply by looking at the pattern of the word you can derive a lot of information from that pattern even though you may or may not know the meaning of this word of course this word we've done before salam to i gave salam so every verb will have some information most important here is that i can recognize this and i can recognize what the three root letters are the next part of it is that we can almost identify with that with simplicity whether this is a past tense present or future tense just by looking at how the root letters and how they are formed what is the pattern that it produces so again this is from the pattern i can tell that this is a past tense verb and then we can see who the doer of the verb is for course this one is salam to we've done this example before so i am the doer of the verb not only that i can easily fit this verb into one of the 10 patterns and we'll talk about that briefly here but inshallah you're going to look at these patterns of verbs there are 10 patterns of verbs that you are going to be most likely coming across in arabic language in its entirety there are probably probably about 15 or 17 but 10, 10 patterns will give you almost all the verbs that you're likely to come across in the quran so these 10 patterns gives additional information how does these roots form into these patterns also you can tell for example this verb belongs to pattern number two so again, this is information just by looking at the way this verb has been formed from the root letters. We can also tell whether this verb is referring to masculine or feminine, whether this number is singular, dual or plural, or is it first person, second person, third person, just like the pronouns we come across. So there will be 14 forms of every verb. And just by looking at this one, I can say that this belongs to the I version. So I did something. Salam to, I gave salam. We can also tell whether that verb is active or passive what do i mean by that when i say in english the imam opened the door here i am telling you that a person the imam opened the door meaning the door of the mosque now if i say to you the door was opened in english now you don't know who opened the door so the door was opened is passive but when i say the imam opened the door that is active so again, just by looking at the pattern of the verb, I don't need any additional words. I can tell you whether that verb is active or passive. Again, a lot of information within just the pattern of the verb. Every verb you are likely to come across will conform 
to one of 10 patterns. It's numbered one to 10 by Western scholars of Arabic. So they've numbered them one to 10 using Roman numbers. The, they are divided largely into two groups. The first group is called Mujarrad, which means the root letters on its own, no addition to it. And then the second group is called Mazid, which means additions. So they're numbered two to 10. And these are the patterns of verbs, which, were, which I was referring to earlier, that every verb you'll come across, you'll need to know which pattern it belongs to. And then inshallah ta'ala, you can easily recognize every form of that verb, long as you know which pattern it belongs to. So this is our pattern number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. They're using a template where fa'ain and lam is used as the base form of the verb. Please don't worry about the details here. I'm just giving you an overview before we jump into the verbs. Now, if you study the verbs in the Quran, I've numbered them here and the number of times they appear in the Quran. So you'll no note instantly the form one, which is this one, Mujarrad, is the most popular. There are 12,000 plus verbs in the Quran on this pattern. Pattern number one, Mujarrad. And then we have, of course, pattern number two, again, very common, pattern number four, and then pattern number eight and so on. So they're numbered in the, the number of times they appear in the Quran. We're going to begin our study with the first one, group one. Why? Because it is the most common. And in fact, to be honest, it is the, probably the most complex. If you get this one, you'll be able to recognize all the others. So we'll start with number one. Why? Because of the common or the most repeated verbs of the Quran are from this pattern. And inshallah ta'ala, just as an overview, just in case you're looking overwhelmed, every single verb in the Arabic will conform to the same rules, irrespective of which pattern it follows. So by the time we're learning the rules for level one, uh, group one, we'll cover all of them. They will conform to the same set of rules in terms of how they're conjugated, in terms of how they're used in a sentence. So there is no difference. It's just the way the verb looks and what is happening to the root letters. So this is an overview of the 10 patterns, inshallah. Please don't worry about them. If you know four or five of them, you are flying in Arabic. That will give you overwhelming majority of the verbs of Quran. And if you learn one, the rest will be exactly the same. So begin with, we'll concentrate on three properties of verbs. Every verb, when you see them, inshallah ta'ala, your first goal is to recognize the verb itself, the root, which inshallah you will do very soon. Second, you need to recognize the pronoun that is within the verb. Please note, every verb will have a pronoun embedded within it. So you need to recognize the doer, which is the pronoun inside every verb. Third thing you should be able to do also, recognize whether the verb is a past tense, present or future tense. This again, you should be able to do instantly. So in again, just as a review of this uh, verb that we got as an example here, the root letters of this verb is seen, lam and meme. It belongs to pattern number two and the doer is Anna, I, and it is a past tense verb. How do I know? Simply way, the way this verb is looking on the screen with the way the, the root letters have been put together and the vowel signs that have been placed on them. Instantly, I know that this is a past tense verb. So this is what we're going to cover inshallah ta'ala. We're going to begin with the past tense verbs and these three pieces of information, the verb, the doer and the tense you'll be able to recognize from every verb that you see, inshallah. The tense of the Arabic verb. In Arabic, essentially, we have three categories when it comes to tenses of verbs. The first one, al-fi'lul madi, which means the perfect tense or the past tense, very similar to what we have in the English language. Then we have imperfect tense, al-fi'lul mudare, and that is perfect, present, and future tense combined. And then we have the imperative or command al-fi'lul amr. So these are the three groups of verbs in Arabic as far as tense is concerned. So let's look at some English examples so we can clarify in our mind what they are. So let's look at the first one. He opened. I'm sure you know that that is a past tense. So the verb opened tells me it is happening in the past tense. And then I have he is opening. He opens. He will open. This will be your imperfect tense and then i'm telling you to open so if, for example i say open the door now that is a command form called imperative in english grammar so these are the three grouping of arabic verbs that we have in terms of tenses 
So in order to say he opened in Arabic, I say Fataha, he opened. If I want to say he is opening, he opens, or he will open, the form will be Yaftahu. And then if I want to tell you to open something, I will say Iftah, open. I hope this is now very clear, the three categories of verbs. Don't worry about recognizing them. We're going to come to that shortly, inshallah. Another example of a verb, he helped. Past tense. He is helping. He helps. He will help. And then we have help. So Nasara, he helped. And then we have Yansuru, means he is helping, or the other two variants also. Unsur, if I'm telling you to help. Unsur, help. Our third example is he went. And then in the present tense, it will become he is going, he goes, he will go. And then if I want you to tell you to go somewhere, I say go. So again, in Arabic, that will be ذَهَبَ يَذْهَبُ idhab. And this is what we're going to learn. It is not obvious at this stage, but each of these categories has a distinct shape and a distinct pattern. And you can instantly recognize that this one is a command form. This one is a mudare. This one is a perfect tense, past tense by just looking at the verb. So this is just an overview for you. Don't worry. Inshallah, by the next few lessons, you'll be able to recognize these patterns. So as a recap, Maudi is an action that has been done, i.e. complete. We will call it perfect tense as a translation in English. We need it until we get familiar with the Arabic terminology. And it's equivalent to the past tense in English. Then Mudare, on the other hand, is a little bit more detailed. It has the present habitual tense, present continuous tense, and also the future tense. Again, the context will tell us which one we are referring to. So don't worry about that at this stage. So an action that has not been done. That is what Mudare is. So it will be done. It is being done, but it's not done. If it's done, it is Mahdi. So when you're speaking at that moment, if the action has been done, then it is the past tense, the perfect tense, Al Mahdi. If the act action is not yet done, being done or will be done, then that is the Mudare. And that is why we call it the imperfect tense. But inshallah, soon we'll go to the Arabic terminology, which are easier and better once you've learned them. And the last is imperative or a command. When you're requesting somebody to do something, telling someone to do something or ordering someone to do something, for example, help. So again, help, eat, uh, walk, go. These are the imperative forms. So these are the three main forms as far as tenses are concerned. And as I mentioned earlier, just by looking at a verb, you will be able to tell me, inshallah, whether it is Mahdi, Mudare or Amr. These are the three main categories. al Mahdi, the perfect tense. The perfect tense or an action that has been already complete or past tense as we refer to them in the English language. Now we mentioned before that every single verb in Arabic is based upon three root letters. So if you can imagine Fa, Ain and Lam representing X, Y and Z, just like an equation X, Y and Z. So we have three root letters. We're now starting with pattern one. If you remember, I mentioned there are 10 patterns. We're going to start with pattern one. We're going to look at the past tense. In the past tense of pattern one, what happens is the three root letters are there on their own. So we have fa, ain, and lam, three root letters. And on the three root letters, the first, second, and third, the first always takes a fatha. The last also always takes a fatha. The middle root letter can take a dhamma, fatha, or a kasra. So the middle root letter can have three vowel signs, any of the three, depending on the verb. But the first and the last always, always takes a fatha. So the template we have here of the three root letters, fa, ain, and lam. Again, note the first and the last root letters always taking a fatha. The middle root letter of this verb, fa, ta, ha, always also takes a fatha. So we have three root letters, fa, ta, ha all taking fath and that literally means he opened again we mentioned that every verb has a pro pronoun hidden within it this is fataha which means he opened in arabic when we learned the 14 pronouns the rafa pronouns if you recall i remem reminded you that the table that we're going to use and how to number them 1 to 14 and you can see an example of that here already the 14 pronouns we have in arabic are huwa Huma, hum, hiya, huma, hunna, anta, 
antuma antum anti antuma antunna ana nahnu this table is very very important i hope you made a copy of it a blank copy inshallah within those 14 boxes we're going to have 14 pronouns all to do with opening fataha fataha is he opened and we're going to go for each pronoun there will be a different form of the verb each of the form is numbered 1 to 14 and this is called sigha in arabic each one has a pattern so let's begin with the first one fataha he opened so we have fataha he opened can you see fataha fataha he opened for they open huma they too opened we will say fataha fataha for they open three or more plural it will be fatahu so we have fataha fataha fatahu for now just learn them inshallah write them down later we're going to look at detail of what the change is happening but i have highlighted them in different color for you so I have the three root letters first giving me fataha he opened but to say they too opened i'm adding an alif which you can see in the example here and for they three or more opened i'm adding a wow with an alif at the end just note of the changes for now let's quickly go through them one more time fataha fataha fatahu now for she opened we're going to use the left hand remember the tpi sign we're going to say she opened fatahat fatahat she opened they too female opened will be fatahata fatahata they two female opened for they opened three or more fe female we will say patahna patahna so let's do the whole six pataha pataha patahu patahat patahata patahna so that's your third person verbs for the example verb pataha he opened they two opened they all opened she opened they two opened they all opened as in plural feminine so you can see the first six done alhamdulillah now you i want to say you opened now there are six words in arabic for you whereas only one in english so you need to be careful when you translate the following six so anta becomes for you opened will be fatahta anta fatahta you opened you too male persons opened will be Fatahtuma. So fatahta, fatahtuma. And you all, plural, three or more, opened will be fatahtum. So fatahta, fatahtuma, fatahtum. Now for female, if I'm talking to a sister, I want to say you opened, I will say very easily fatahti, you opened. For the two, it will be the same as the male. So we'll have fatahtuma. And for you, feminine, plural, it will be fatahtunna. So let's do the six again for you. Fatahta, fatahtuma, fatahtum. Fatahti, fatahtuma, fatahtunna. For I opened, I opened will be fatahtu. I opened. For we opened, three or more of us, two or more of us, fatahna, fatahna. So these are your 14 forms of the verb fataha. Depending on who is doing the opening, you will make some changes to the root to indicate the doer of the verb. So let's go through the whole 14 together, inshallah. Practice them a few times. Don't worry, I'm going to go through the detail, explaining it later, but it's important we memorize the verbs in this order. So let's do it one more time. Fataha, fataha, fatahu. Fatahat, fatahata, fatahna. Fatahta, fatahtuma, fatahtum. Fatahti, fatahtuma, fatahtunna. Fatahtu, fatahna. So these are your 14 forms in the past tense, al madi or the perfect tense in Arabic. Each, pron each uh, one having an embedded pronoun within it to give us the meaning. So if you learned it, the pronouns, the way I explained, and you're learning the verbs exactly the same, putting them in the same table, this confusion will be removed, inshallah. So please rewrite these verbs, practice them exactly how Saudi using TPI, and I've explained TPI. For you before please look at the lesson on pronouns inshallah is exactly the same the hand positions are exactly the same practice 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 inshallah ta'ala i listen i forget i see i remember i practice i learn i teach i master the perfect tense verb 
in detail. Now let's take a microscopic look at the perfect tense verb. What did we do earlier? Now again, I will give you the main principle. We have three root letters here, fa, ta, and ha. And we're going to put it in the past tense and simply it follows the pattern of fataha. So fataha is your number one. And please note this, this is called sigha number one. Most important numbers you need to note is number one and number four. So we have number one here, fataha, which means he opened. There is no suffix added to that verb. There is nothing added at the end. And the pronoun that is hidden within the verb is called huwa. In Arabic grammar, they call this verb uh, pronoun mustatir, which means hidden. So huwa is embedded in meaning in the pattern fa ta ha. Please note this. It is only when you see fa ta ha in a verb form, then you look for an external doer, i.e. the translation, there's a possibility of somebody else doing it apart from the pronoun itself. Don't worry, I'll explain in more detail later. So we will say here, the doer is huwa. If there's nothing else after it to indicate a doer, we will translate as he opened. Please note this, inshallah. But if you see after fataha hamidun, then it will be hamid opened. So this is your number one, fataha, he opened is the literal translation. Position number one or siga number one. Number two is they too opened. For that, the TPI sign is this way. Fataha, they too opened. Is there a suffix there? Yes, there is. I've added an alif at the end. This alif represents the pronoun huma. So this alif represents huma. Alif equals huma in this case. So the doer is very clear here. The doer is alif here acting for huma, meaning they too opened. So again, if you see this one, you translate simply as they too opened. So this is your doer. The fa'il is the alif. Please note that. And they too, this is the dual version. Number three, they opened. Now here we have a suffix which includes a wow and an alif. Please note the pronoun that is hidden within that or represented by the wow is whom, meaning they opened. And the doer here is the wow. So what is the alif doing there? The alif is playing a very important role. What the alif is doing is avoiding the confusion of somebody reading this wow as an and, A and D. Remember the word we've seen before, A and D, wa equals and. Now in Arabic, the script that normally used use, is used, there is no vowel signs. So there's a possibility the reader could confuse this wow with the wow of and. So the alif is there to make sure that the reader is not confused, that the verb is ending here and the doer here is the wow itself. So it is there to avoid confusion. So the alif is not the doer, the doer is wow, representing whom. And that is what, what the suffix is there for. So again, one more time, let's go through. Fataha, he opened. Fataha, they too opened. And we have fatahu, they opened. The alif representing huma, wow representing whom. And the first one, there is nothing representing the hua itself. It is assumed to be embedded within the pattern. Number four, she opened will be Fatahat. Please note there is a ta at the end as our suffix. But this ta does not represent the pronoun that we've seen here. What this ta represents is a sign of femininity. So we will say that here is embedded within the verb and therefore it is mustatir, hidden in far as Arabic grammar is concerned. So what is the rule here? When you see fatahat, there is a possibility of having a doer, which is a noun. So for example, if I want to say Hamid opened, I will say Fataha Hamidun, Hamid opened. But if I want to say Maryam opened, I will say Fatahat Maryamu, Fatahat Maryamu. So if the doer is feminine noun, you will use Fatahat. If the doer is a masculine noun, you will use Fataha. And this is why number one and number four is very, very important. So the ta is a sign of it being feminine and the doer here is hidden within the verb. So number five is they two female opened, which is huma as far as the pronoun is concerned. And that will be patahata, patahata, and the ta remains for, as a sign of feminine. And the suffix is ta plus the alif. The actual pronoun that is, hid that is hidden is huma, and therefore the fa'il, the doer, is only the alif. The ta is a sign of it being Feminine. So again, those are the two points you need to know about them. So Alif represents they 
two, which is Huma. Lastly, we have the feminine plural, which is number six. In number six, we have they plural opened, which will be Patahna. Patahna. Patahna, they opened. The suffix, of course, is nun plus fatha, which is added to the root. And that represents hunna, which is from the pronoun I'm sure you can recall. And that noon here is also telling us that it is a feminine plural. So please note the doer we can say here na representing hunna, just to keep things simple, inshallah ta'ala. The other very important point note at number six, something strange happens. So far in every verb, so far that we've gone through number one to number five, the third root letter has taken a fatha. Same as the others in this case. But what happens at number six? The root letter now takes a sukun. So it becomes not fatahna, fatahna. Please note that from now onwards, the third root letter will have a sukun. Fatahna. Now we have our second person starting with you, masculine singular. You opened. Of course, that is anta, we know from before. So the adverb version will be fatahta. Patahta. Please note the sukun on the third root letter. Patahta. And the suffix, of course, is ta with fatha. And the pronoun is anta. And the doer is, of course, the ta with a fatha. So from now on, the doers are very easy. Patahta, you masculine singular opened. And again, please note that the ta here is acting as the doer. Now, I want to say you two masculine persons opened. So I will say here very easily in Arabic. Patahtuma, patahtuma, you too opened. The suffix is very clear. You can see here, and it is representing antuma, and the doer is tuma. Okay, that is the doer representing antuma. So, very easy, alhamdulillah. You can see the suffix very clearly laid out for you, even though I've colored it in red to make it clear for you. Then you have you all. If you remember the pronoun antum, you all opened. So, how do we do that in Arabic? We will say in Arabic, Patahtum, you all opened. Again, suffix of course is tum, and it is representing the pronoun antum, and we end up with tum being the doer, and that is your doer in this verb. So one more time, fatahta, fatahtuma. Fat Number ten is of course second person singular feminine, and that will be in Arabic for the verb fataha, fatahti, you female opened. The suffix is very clear, ti. And of course, the pronoun is anti, and the doer is the T itself. Number 11 will be you two female opened, and that will be in Arabic, patahtuma, patahtuma, so fatahti, patahtuma. And of course, the ending you can see very clearly, tuma, antuma representing, and tuma is your actual doer. For you all feminine, when I say all, I mean three or more, I will say in Arabic, patahtunna. Patah tunna and the ending of course the suffix is tunna and the pronoun is antunna representing and this is the tunna which is the doer in this verb. That leaves only number 11 and number 12 which is I opened and we opened. That's basically what we have here. So I open will be fatah tu and again please note tu is the suffix and of course the pronoun is ana. Pronoun is ana and the doer is to represents the doer of the verb itself. And that will be your doer too. As far as we open will be patahna, patahna. And of course, the ending is very clear. Noon fatha with the alif at the end. And that represents nahnu. And that is your doer as far as the verb is concerned. So what have you learned here by looking at detail of each of the formation is that number one, in the past tense, the three root letters remain exactly intact exactly in that in that same order what we are doing is adding suffixes at the end and each change represents one of the 14 pronouns so you can translate each of these in the pronoun it represents for example fatahtu i opened alhamdulillah now that you've seen in detail how the suffix is working in the verb you take the three root letters you add something at the end and you get different meaning each one representing one of the 14 pronouns I've laid exactly the same thing for you in a different order here or different layout. It is done vertically from 1 to 14. Just to illustrate a few of the points, inshallah, this will help you. I've also numbered the columns at the top. A is, of course, the English translation of the example verb we're using. 
B is the verb itself in Arabic and C is the number. This is called Sigha in Arabic. Each position has a number and then numbered 1 to 14. And the pro pronoun it represents, which is in column number D. And in column E, you have the verb itself and column F, you have the suffix, in particular the doer. What is the doer? How is it represented in the verb itself? So, so a few points to note on the table and you can use this inshallah for your notes. Number one and number four, we will say that the doer is hidden and it is written here, as you can see, mustatir. The doer is not declared by any letter of the alphabet or anything else. So number one and number four. And in number two and five, the alif actually is the alif of dual. Please note that number two and number five. And we also have in number six, the noon is the sign of feminine plural, which we've seen already, alhamdulillah. And in number three, we will say the alif at the end of number three is to avoid the confusion of it being misread. So alif is not the doer, the wow is the doer. It's placed after the wow, so you will not misread this wow as the wow wow for A and D and in Arabic. And then we have number four and number five. You see an additional ta there. That ta is actually a sign of it being feminine, not the doer itself. And of course, the few things to note, which we are going to look at now, is that if you see the verb form one, which is fataha or fatahat, there is a possibility of having a noun as a doer. What do I mean that by that? Every verb in Arabic has a doer embedded in it. So huwa, he opened, okay, huwa fataha, or she opened fatahat. They have the word huwa and here embedded in it. But if you see, for example, fataha hamidun, hamid opened. So only with fataha, there's a possibility of having a outside doer, which is masculine, and with fatahat, it's possible to have a feminine doer. For example, fatahat mariamu, mariam opened. And that is the ones to watch out for. So number one and number four will be used with an external noun doer. Other with the pronoun doer, you will use all of the one to 14. One more point to note, the doer is always, always rafa. The doer is always, always rafa. So, so far, you've come across a set of pronouns which are already known as Rafa pronouns. You remember those? Hua, huma, hum, hiya, huma, hunna. They're Rafa. Okay, they're subject pronouns. But the pronoun that is embedded in the verb itself, which is listed in column two here, all of those are also doers. Therefore, they're also considered to be Rafa pronouns. Even though it's only one letter, alif, wow, etc., they are Rafa pronouns. Why? Because they're the fa'il, the doer. Doer will always, always be Rafa in Arabic. So please note that also, inshallah ta'ala, in your notes, and this will avoid you getting into any confusion. I hope and pray that you will do the Fataha verb. You write it out at least two, three times in the table that I designed for you or showed you the design of going back with the pronouns. Please, please use the same table and write it out at least two or three times and spaces out between the times you write it. For example, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Also, please, at least three, four, five times a day. It's going to take you no more than one and a half minutes, two minutes. The thing that you have written down on a piece of paper, the verbs, please use your hand signs and practice loudly. Why? Because within a few days, I want you to memorize all of these. Now, if you memorize the Fataha verb and you know what the suffixes are, the Alif, the Waw, the Ta, etc., that has been added to the end, then you can do this with any other verb that fits the same pattern. So let me share with you some verbs. Kafara, Ja'ala, Kafara he disbelieved, Ja'ala he made, Valama he wronged, Khalaqa he created, Dhakara he remembered, Abada he worshipped, Razaqa he provided, Fa'ala he did, Nasara he helped. Now can you see? Rhymes exactly with Fataha. And you can take any of these and you can change the ending, the suffixes, and you can change 14 verbs from each one of these I'm giving you. Subhanallah. If you see in the shop a sale, buy one, get one free. You run in to get the deal. Here you learn one and you get 14 free. You can't get a better sale than this. I'll show you better sales later, inshallah. But you can't get better than this. So if you learned Fataha well, Kafara, Ja'ala, Dhalama, etc. are all yours. Now let me share something with you. Imagine you're standing on the runway. Runway. You're mad to do so, but standing on the runway where planes fly off, then come. If the plane flies off, which part of the plane do you see? 
of course, you will see the back end of the plane. The back end of the plane. This will remind you in the past tense, the back end, the ending of the word is telling me who's doing the action. In the mudare, it will be the front end. So we'll talk about that later, inshallah, when we go to the other tense. So here, you'll pay attention to the end of the verb and it will tell you who's doing the action, which pronoun is hidden. And if you learn it one, well, one, well, uh, one of them well, inshallah, there are about 9,000 uh, examples of these in the Quran. You should be able to recognize the various forms of these verbs, madi, mudare, and amr, inshallah, once we get to it. So this is the beauty. If you follow this example, inshallah, learn one well, you will get 14 for every verb that falls into this pattern. Biggest sale of the century. Go for it, brothers and sisters. Practice, practice, practice. I listen, I forget. I see, I remember. I practice, I learn. I teach, I master. May Allah grant us all of us tawfiq. Conjugate nasara daraba. Taking the three root letters, huwa being the base, which is fataha, and adding suffixes etc to it and forming different sigha or different forms. The 14 forms is called conjugation. We've already done that with fataha. So let's quickly review what we did. There is no translation here. Just the practice, please. Inshallah, you can work with the translation yourself. Fataha means to open. So let's quickly go through the 14 forms of fataha. So we have fataha, fataha, fatahu, and then we have fatahat, fatahata, fatahna. And then for you, I have fatahta, fatahtuma, fatahtum. And then we have fatahti, fatahtuma, fatahtunna. Then for I, fatahtu, we, fatahna. Now, if you do that with fataha, you can do that with other verbs. Let's take an example. Nasara means he helped. So nasara follows exactly the same pattern as fataha for the past tense madi. So what we have here, nasara, he helped. Nasara. Nasaru. I hope you can see it's exactly the same as Fataha. Nasarat, Nasarata, Nasarna. Or Anta, Nasarta, Nasartuma, Nasartum. Anti, Nasarti, Nasartuma, Nasartunna. Or I, Nasartu, Nasarna. Tell me, is this difficult? I hope not. All you need is practice. Next, we're going to do the same with the verb. Daraba. Daraba means he struck. He struck or he hit or he gave an example that's also used in Quran. So Daraba, now exactly the same. We know it follows the Fataha pattern as far as the past tense is concerned. So let's good, quickly do that. Daraba, Daraba, Darabu. And then we have the feminine. Darabat, Darabata, Darabna. And then we have Anta, Darabta, Darabtuma, Darabtum. And then for the feminine second person, Darabti, darabtuma, darabtunna. And for I, darabtu, darabna. Here on the screen, you have the three verbs that I've just conjugated for you in 14 forms. I left one blank just to remind you that you can, these are not the only three. Hundreds and hundreds of verbs will follow exactly the same pattern because they all belong to group one and they all have the past tense exactly the same as fataha. I've given these three examples for a particular reasons, inshallah, it will become clear in forthcoming lessons. But every verb will follow this example. Just one point which I did not illustrate or go into detail when I was explaining, I thought I'd share that with you. Here, you got the example here. Remember this one? Now, fatahna, and look at the last one. Fatahna. So be careful on the pronunciation. The first one is short. There is no alif. The last one for nahnu is long. So this is another point that needed to be highlighted here just to make it easy so you're not misreading it, inshallah. So it will be fatahna will be this way. They female opened and fatahna we opened. So please note that one point which I did not illustrate earlier for you. So that's all you need, inshallah, on this screen. The three verbs. You've got all your suffixes, everything that you need, inshallah, to master this. Please, please, please master these verbs. Absolutely critical for your understanding of Quran. I'll conclude the first part of lesson 15 here. Inshallah, we split the video up into two, so it make it easier for you. The video will not be too long. In the second part, we're going to learn how to negate a verb. What do I mean? If I say to you, he opened, fataha, he opened. But how do I say he did not open? How do I negate the verb? That's what we will learn, inshallah. In the second part, we'll also learn a bit more detail about the doer of the verb in the verbal sentence 
inshallah. So few more points to cover in part B of the video. I hope and pray inshallah ta'ala you found this video beneficial. Please do like and share and encourage the ummah to learn Arabic. It is a lot easier than learning English. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us tawfiq. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الذي علم بالقلم